Amen. We acknowledge the presence of God that is in this place, but also the great leadership he has given us. Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green, Sr. and Supervisor Phyllis N. Green. To the greatest presiding elder team in all African Methodism, presiding elder Philip C. Anderson, and to his queenly wife, Sister Sandra A. Anderson. We thank Reverend Carey for being our worship leader today and, uh, and our ministry team, but I, I gotta stop, I missed one. To the greatest thing God ever gave me after Jesus, Sister Donna Black. Now, Reverend Curry and the ministry team, and we thank the ministry team for all they're doing. To our board of stewards, our board of trustees, our class leader council, to our musicians, stewardess, ushers, ministry chairs, AV team, other officers, visitors, members, and friends, we greet you in the joy and the love of the Lord. We're in the last sermon in a, a short sermon series on repairing the breach. Um, this is sermon number three, and we're going to look at a passage in scripture most of you know. Uh, it's Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Some have called this the parable of the Good Samaritan. Reading, starting at verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he came to the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense you may have. Which of these three? do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Oh God, we need a word. We need a word that can change our lives for the rest of our lives. Hide John Black behind the cross. No one needs to hear from him. But you speak a word to him and you speak a word through him that your people might be edified. You speak a word to him and you speak a word through him so that someone will be saved. And we'll be careful as to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our sermon title, Seeing Beyond Labels. Seeing Beyond Labels. In 1988, I met Peter Nydig. I interned with him while I was stationed in a place called Iwakuni, Japan. He was, at the time, a leading expert on domestic violence. As I trained with him, I discovered his teachings on the notion of labeling. Labeling is defined as the process of identifying and categorizing behaviors or individuals in a way that may influence how they are perceived and treated by others. Nydig viewed labeling as a method of reducing people. It's a reductionary method that reduce people into a new category of being subhuman or less human. And by reducing them into that category, it allowed for the labeler to mistreat or misunderstand that person. 
I, I could grasp this concept, and let me share a little story. It's a little hard story, but it's a story. Fasten your seatbelts. Uh, my brother was a Vietnam vet, and when he went to Vietnam, he constantly wrote letters. And the letters would be to my mother, but the letters would be read by my mother to the whole family. And when my brother first got to Vietnam, the letters would say things like, Mom, we're shooting at people. I didn't do anything to these people. Why are we shooting at people? He would also ask for, uh, you all know this, pre-sweetened Kool-Aid. <laughs> Vietnam vets lived on pre-sweetened Kool-Aid because they could put it in that nasty water and drink it. Well, after sending a few letters uh, talking about how he was forced to shoot at people, we got another letter. And the letter said, Mom, I killed my first gook. He couldn't kill a person. He couldn't kill a person. So he had to reduce that person to a label. And once he reduced that person to a label, it was all right to shoot him. That's why labeling is so dangerous. Peter Nydig also made a very astute observation about labeling. Peter Nydig labeled, uh, classified labeling as a self-angering thought. Rather, it is overt or subtle, every time we assign a label to someone, we foster anger in ourselves, not, not be overt anger. And, and so there's no wonder when we see KKK rallies and Proud Boy demonstrations that they're also an association with violence because labeling makes us angry. We get angry at that person Fill in the blank. Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, provides us with some additional information about labeling. In India, Nazi Germany, and the United States, society is organized into caste systems. The USA caste system is based on race. The lowest caste of the USA caste system, of course, are African Americans. They are the untouchables, the Dalits. The caste system is the worst manifestation of labeling. It allows for all kinds of horrific things to happen to those of a lesser caste. For those of us as African Americans, and we look back at our history, we see enslavement, murder, lynchings, ex medical experimentation. We were robbed, tortured, and raped as a people. And even today, we suffer from a very inordinate amount of incarcerations by our federal, state, and local governments. The reason that folks aren't up in arms is because of this process of labeling. And let me just say something too, please understand African Americans aren't the only group that suffer from labeling in the United States. It's a caste system. Anyone who is not white, male, cisgendered, well-educated, and Christian fall in a lower class. Non-English speakers, a lower class. All women, a lower class. Working class uh, people, a lower caste. Immigrants, a lower caste. The mentally ill, a lower caste. Now, this isn't the order. It's just saying that they are all in a lower caste. While there are many differences between these groups, they all suffer from the process of labeling. In our text, we see the Good Samaritan. While this title does not come from scripture, it's a fitting title. Samaritans were considered to be mixed-race people. The Jews of Jesus' day was very proud of the fact that they were a pure-race people. 
That's why you see all those lineages in the Bible. They want to prove that they are the real thing. The Samaritans also worshipped in a different location, on a different holy mountain, and they had a different version of the Pentateuch or the books of Moses. So not only were they mixed race, they were heretics. And those were the labels that were applied to them. When a good observing Jew came in contact with a Samaritan, there was a chance that that Jew would end up unclean before the day was done. So the Jew labeled them as unclean. But we see Jesus. And Jesus comes into the scene, and Jesus in our parable, and Jesus in his ministry, and Jesus who is in our presence with us today is loving the labels off of people. In John chapter 4, Jesus has his newly formed disciples and they're getting ready to understand ministry. And he says, guess what, you all? We got to go through Samaria. For you to be able to be trained properly in ministry, we got to go to that place they have labeled as unsafe, unclean, lesser than. And not only does Jesus go to Samaria, he picks one of those women that has labels all over her name. And he actually has the audacity to sit in the middle of the town Drinking water, which is the same as partaking at a meal in Jewish eyes. Drinking water with a woman of ill repute. He loved the label off of her. In, John, in Luke chapter 17, there are 10 people who have leprosy. And Jesus prays for all 10, and all 10 are healed, and they leave, and only one come back. And Jesus makes a point of saying, see that one who came back? That's the one you all labeled as a Samaritan. Jesus loved to label off of people. Yes, he did. In our Western theology, we assign the title Good Samaritan. And even that is a labeling. The term Good Samaritan is akin to the term Good Negro or Magic Negro. Both terms imply that the group is substandard, but every now and then somebody in the group makes par. If those aren't golfers, you ask them, they'll tell you what that means. Now, I'm assuming that you know this story, so I'm going to give you three little points and I'll sit down. And those who don't know the story, call me. I would love to share the whole story with you one-on-one. -on -one. Amen. Ms. Johnson, get ready for those phone calls. Number one, be like Jesus. Love the label off of people. Jesus was constantly loving the label off of people. Jesus never called the protagonist in our parable the Good Samaritan. He called him a man who understood his neighbor. Good preaching should, make, should, make the comf should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Jesus does just that in our parable. The, the lawyer who came to Jesus with these questions was very comfortable, and Jesus allowed him to be afflicted. For those who had suffered from the label of being Samaritans, he allowed his words to comfort them. As we look at our nation, we realize that the process of alleviating labels in our nation means that those who are comfortable are going to have to be afflicted, and those who are afflicted are going to have to be comforted. We, we don't do God's service by backing off from the truth. Those who don't want to deal with our history, don't want to deal with our story, don't want to deal with the reality of America, those who want us to ban books or burn books, those who are trying to take certain words out of legal documents need to be verbally afflicted. And those who have suffered from those who have labeled them, need to be comforted. I, 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 I'm going to go off script a minute. Can I, may I go off script? My generation 
of African Americans suffered under this notion that it was our issue. If we could just get the right education, just get the right resume, just get all those things in the right place, society would embrace us and love us and treat us as equals. We even had a doctrine called uplift. If we could just uplift the race with the talented 10. But guess what happened? We got the resumes. We got the experiences. We matched resume line for resume line, and we found out it had nothing to do with us, but with the label that had been given to us. All right, we'll go back. We'll go back. Mm -hmm. Peter Nydig believed that the antidote for labeling is to see people in their fullness, in their complexities. There are times that we label and there's times that we are labeled. And that's true for everybody, regardless of which caste you're in. So Jesus looked at, to that expert of the law and showed behavior, not label. Which man was a neighbor? It was the man who acted like a neighbor. It was the man who took care of the person who was a victim to robbers. And we can love the labels off of people when we start to see them as who they are. All women don't like act alike. All men don't act alike. All black people don't act alike. All white people don't act alike. We are mixed, complicated people, and we must look at the individual and not the label. Martin Luther King said this. He, he longed for a nation where we would respect people because of the content of their character. Amen. Point number two. We are made uncomfortable by this parable because this parable, and here's the point, demands that we find our neighbors. We like to think our neighbor is the person next door. But if we read this parable, we find out that the protagonist was not geographically associated with the victim. He lived in Samaria, but the protagonist lived somewhere in Israel. What made the, pro what made the victim the protagonist's neighbor was the needs of the victim. Our neighbor is the person that needs the gifts and callings that are inside of us. Our neighbor is a person that needs us to become the miracle in their lives. Our neighbor is a person that addresses the issues of life that have labeled our neighbor. The neighbor is a person who could benefit from the talent, the time, and the treasures that God has placed in this room. Our neighbors don't share the same label. But we need to minister to our neighbor. Number three, we get labeled. So the third point is relabel yourself and relabel your neighbor. We need our Savior's eyes. We need our God's eyes. God gave us a Savior that knew how to look at people and see things that other people just couldn't see. Those are our Father's eyes. Our Father looked at a man named Gideon, a man full of fear and low self-esteem, and our Father saw a mighty man of war. Our father looked at a little boy named David who might have been alienated from his biological father. There he was, just a little shepherd, not, not destined to amount of, to anything. But our father saw in that little shepherd boy who was separated from his family, the greatest king of Israel. Our God and father saw a prostitute in a foreign land named Rahab. 
And in that prostitute in a foreign land, he saw the progenitor of Jesus Christ. Our, our father looked at a man that was a zealot, a man that consented to the stoning of Stephen, a man that had arrested many of the faithful, a man named Saul. And in that Saul, he saw the apostle Paul, a man who would write most of the New Testament, a man who would evangelize all of Asia Minor, a man who would become for us one of the patriots of the saints. And he, God saw him there. When God looks at us, he doesn't see the labels. But when God looks at us, what does he see? He sees a peculiar people. He sees a chosen generation. He sees a royal priesthood. He sees a holy nation. And when we look in the mirror of life, we must see that in ourselves and see it in others. So we ought to speak God's words over our labels. So when they tell us you'll never be anything, say, oh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm the head and not the tail. When they say you'll never go anywhere, I'm going up to yonder to be with the Lord. When they say, well, you're just a, you're just a, a, a no-nonsense, I mean, a no-account person, we need to say God has already placed on my account the riches of Jesus. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. When they talk about our sins, we can own up to it. No need to back down from it. We can say, I am a sinner, but I've been saved by God's grace. Label, label yourself as victorious. Label yourself as an overcomer. Label yourself in such a way that when you look in the mirror, you look at your hands and your hands look new and you look at your feet and your feet do too. We have to learn how to label ourselves in such a way that when people hear our label, they see God's light in us and they glorify him. We need to look at our neighbor and see Christ in them. Amen?